Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good afternoon. Selamat siang, Bapak and Ibu, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to ICAW and Shinewing's first ever regional webinar. My name is Andika, and I'll be your host for today. We are excited to kickstart our... Oh, just give me one second. I think I'm running into a technical issue. Apology for the uh, minor interruption. So um, I would like to uh, welcome you to our first ever regional webinar. Um, my name is Andika and I'll be your host for the day. And uh, we are excited to kickstart our partnership with Shinewing International, as well as to welcome Shinewing Indonesia as our latest addition to our authorized ring employers in the country. Uh, we're looking forward for more joint initiatives with Shinewing in the region uh, and globally moving forward. Uh, today's event is the most talked about topic in the profession, even until now, which is the future of audit, focus on strengthening uh, the uh, focus of the strengthening the audit quality to assist uh, pre uh, post pandemic recovery. Now, allow me to read out some of the housekeeping rules to make sure that you have the best experience. Uh, to enjoy the full experience, we recommend accessing this webinar from your desktop or laptop. And then during the webinar, you may post your questions on the Q&A box. So please do not use the chat box because uh, it will be difficult for the moderator to spot your question. And then should you run into any te technical difficulties, please email my colleague, suci.kurnia at icaw.com and she will assist you in uh, trying to reach the, uh, uh, the Zoom link. And then uh, we have quite a few of uh, registrations for today's event. So just in case you cannot join this room, uh, because of the Zoom uh, room capacity limitation. This event is also uh, live streamed on Shinewing Indonesia's uh, YouTube channel, uh, which with the link which is shown on the uh, screen. And then we also like to advise you that the e-certificate will be issued to participants who filled in the uh, post-event uh, question or survey after the event. And then uh, I would like to also uh, inform you that this webinar is uh, recorded. Ladies and gentlemen, before we start with the main agenda, allow me to invite uh, Mark Billington, ICW Managing Director International, to say a few words on behalf of ICW. Mark, the time is yours. Thank you, Andika, and good day, ladies and gentlemen. It gives me great pleasure on behalf of the Institute of Chartered Accountants in England and Wales to host this joint event with Shinewing Indonesia. I welcome ICAW President David Matthews, CEO Shinewing Indonesia, Pak Mitch Suhali, as well as our panelists and all participants. Founded in 1880, ICAW has over 140 years experience of educating and skilling chartered accountants, and in that time has seen the profession face many challenges. Today, with over 158,000 members around the world, we are a leader of the global accountancy and audit profession. So how are we ensuring ICAW chartered accountants are equipped to deal with the changes audit and assurance practices, as well as the business world are facing? The technical knowledge is as important as ever, but a successful financial, finance professional needs to be ethical, curious, and prepared to challenge accepted thinking. Fluency in the language of our digital world and an understanding of how to help create sustainable businesses is also vital. 2020 and into 2021 has, of course, been like no other for ICAW. We have seen the significant changes driven by economic and trade shifts and the changing impact of technology accelerating in a way few predicted because of the pandemic. Throughout this turbulent period, we have continued to focus on supporting our members building influence and reputation and attracting some of the very best talent globally into our profession. We've partnered with government agencies, universities and local national bodies to raise the profile of our institute and the profession and to broaden access to knowledge and experience beyond national borders, some of which will be touched on later as we discuss audit quality and the future of audit. But we're not just about audit and I encourage you to look at the many free resources we offer through our website to support the profession. Importantly, the attraction of becoming an ICAW Chartered Accountant continues to grow amongst young people. 
and I see this further increasing over the coming years. To that end, I'm delighted that Shinewing Indonesia has met the quality mark of approval to be an ICAW authorized training employer for ICAW students. And we very much hope to build on this to deepen our relationship with Shinewing globally to future proof our profession. ICAW chartered accountants continue to play an important role in fulfilling the Institute's vision of a world of sustainable economies. We're confident that with your help, our future members and our profession will go on to make significant contributions to these goals globally. Thank you, enjoy the event, and Andika, back to you. Thank you, Mark, for the welcome remarks. Now, I would like to invite uh, the CEO of Shanwing Indonesia, Bapak Michel Suharli, to also send a couple of words on behalf of Shanwing Indonesia and Shanwing International. Pamich, over to you. Thank you, Andika, for hosting and the opportunity. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome and warm regards. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Salam kebajikan. Om Swastiastu, Namo Buddhaya, Salam Sejahtera, Shalom. Good morning, David Matthews in UK and Catherine Beckshaw in Scotland. Good afternoon, Mark Billington in Singapore and Ahmadi Hadibroto in Indonesia. Also, good evening to Marco Curley in Australia. Thank you for all of your value time for sharing at our today's event. I am very happy that today we can meet and discuss about the future audit, strengthening audit quality. We will get insight about the strengthened audit quality to assist post-pandemic recovery. We are lucky since today even presenting top leaders from international accounting organizations with exceptional reputation. This event is a collaboration between ICAEW and Sandwing International as an inauguration of Sandwing Indonesia becoming the authorized training employer of ICAEW. As a world-class accounting and consulting firm, Sandwing Indonesia creates unique and new position in the market. First position as the archipelago firms which means that Sunwing Indonesia plans to establish office in many provinces in Indonesia. Second position as the Asia Pacific Business Hub, which means Sunwing Indonesia provides international standard services to multinational companies which investing in Asia Pacific with the presence of China Business Desk, Korea Business Desk, Japan Business Desk, and other international speaking business desk. Third position as the Indonesia Investment Gateway, which means that Sunwing Indonesia is a gateway for investment, gateway for foreign direct investment come to invest in Indonesia, as well as for Indonesia companies go to invest in other countries. The leaders and all people of Sandwing Indonesia believe that quality is the only way to customer satisfaction. Quality becomes our pillar of how Sandwing Indonesia retain our loyal customers, acquire new customers, and international referral. In the context of assurance services, audit quality is imperative to maintain professional honor and personal integrity of us. Only with a focus on strengthening audit quality, the accounting profession can survive and grow. Sandwing Indonesia realized that we are not superhero who can struggle for audit quality alone. We must build a conducive ecosystem together with regulators and other organizations. Today's topic is relevant since Sandwing Indonesia is optimistic that there will be recovery after many crises due to pandemic. All of us understand 
the negative impacts of the pandemic are tremendous both on health and the social economy. Audit quality will be an absolute term for a country's economic recovery. Technical improvements, technologies development, and professional wisdom will complement each other as sources of energy for a post-pandemic rebound. Ladies and gentlemen, it's time for us to listen, to get insight from our speakers today. I wish there are many returns from our discussion can be implemented and make strengthening audit quality as every day, everyone job in the auditing ecosystem. That's all from me. Andika, back to you. Thank you. Thank you, Pamich, for the uh, wonderful uh, remarks. Um, ladies and gentlemen, we will now start with our main agenda, which is the keynote by ICAW President David Matthews, FCA. A little bit about David. David worked with KPMG since graduating from the London School of Economics in 1982. He qualified as a char ICAW chair accountant in 1985 and became a partner in 1996, working primarily with large multinational organizations, which have included AstraZeneca, hmm, quite a popular name these days, uh, Bunzel, uh, Diageo, Cadbury, Eurotano, and many more. Whilst at KPMG, he has held a number of management roles, including a member of both the board and executive committee of KPMG in the UK, head of accounting advisory services, head of audit for KPMG, KPMG's Consumer and Industrial Markets Group, and head of KPMG's drink sector. In addition to being a council member since 20, uh, 2010, his work with ICAW has included membership of the Professional Standards Board and of the Technical Strategy Board, including as chair since 2013. Ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, please welcome ICAW President David Matthews. David, over to you. Uh, thank you very much indeed, Andika, and good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm delighted to have the opportunity to speak with you today, even if I can't be with you in person. The past year has been challenging for all of us, to say the least, but things are improving, I think, as we know, and I think that means that there are brighter times ahead. So I hope that you, your families and friends have stayed healthy and continue to do so. I'd like to say at the outset how delighted I also am on behalf of everybody at the ICAW to be make, marking the start of our new partnership with Shinewing as a new authorised training employer in Indonesia. The most pressing global issues require global business leadership and building the next generation of chartered accountants will help ensure we have that leadership for the future to guide us in embracing the opportunities and tackling the challenges ahead. So as part of ICAW's global network of over 6,000 authorizing training employers, Shinewing will play an important role in enabling a future world of strong and sustainable economies. And we're delighted to be working with you. So on to today's topic, looking at how we can strengthen the quality of audit. This is always an area of much debate, but particularly so at the moment both in terms of the crucial role it will play in the global recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic, as well as the ongoing need to strengthen and reform audit following highly publicized corporate failures around the world. Now, there are many ways in which I could talk about this, and I could spend a lot of time talking about specific aspects of the audit process, such as how we seek evidence or document findings, or aspects of audit which have sometimes given rise to concerns, such as the auditor's role in relation to fraud or business viability. But instead, today I'd like to address the topic under two headings. Firstly, I'll consider regulation and reform, simply because this goes to the technical heart of audit quality and is so prominent for our profession at the moment, particularly, but not exclusively, in the UK. Secondly, I'll cover reputation and trust, characteristics which are essential not just for audit, but for the whole of our profession, if it's to thrive in the future. Within this, of course, it's not just the need to operate in accordance with the high standards of professionalism and behaviours inherent in our code of ethics, 
but also the need to remain relevant and skilled in a rapidly changing world where many existing business models are being threatened. Before I start, let me just amplify a little about my background, which you heard from Andika. Whilst I've been involved with the ICAW as a council and board member for the last decade, until May last year, when I took up the presidency of ICAW, I was a partner with KPMG, having been with that firm for 38 years since graduating. Importantly for today's discussion, I am an auditor by background and had the privilege of being responsible for the audits of some of the UK's largest international groups, as well as undertaking a variety of other risk control and transaction based assignments. But in the latter part of my time at KPMG, effectively for most of the last decade, I was an executive committee and board member with responsibility for quality, risk management and regulation. And in that latter context, I was involved with many of the regulatory reform initiatives that I will turn to shortly. But firstly, let me say a few words about the role of audit. If I could have the next slide, please. Now, audit plays a critical role in the global economy. It provides businesses, investors, and a range of other stakeholders with confidence that financial information is true and fair, holding people to account and enabling transparency. It enables businesses to strategize and plan ahead with confidence and ultimately ensures economic stability. But throughout my career, there's been talk of an expectation gap in relation to audit, most commonly in relation to the auditor's role in preventing fraud and corporate collapses. But more recently, we've seen a flurry of corporate failures across the world, which have called into question the role of the auditor and the quality of audit work. All of this has led to intense media criticism and significant political and regulatory scrutiny, at least in the UK. But regulatory reviews have also taken place or are in progress in a number of other countries, including Australia, India, the Netherlands, and so on. But let me give you a brief overview of the programme of audit reform currently underway in the UK. If I could have the next slide, please. We've seen three regulatory reviews over the last couple of years. One, regarding the role and structure of the UK regulator, currently known as the Financial Reporting Council. One, looking at competition and resilience in the audit market. And the final review, examining the very role and purpose of audit itself. And the ICAW supported and contributed comprehensively to each of these reviews. The man in charge of the third review into the quality and effectiveness of audit, Sir Donald Bryden, spoke at the ICAW shortly after the release of his report and was clear on his view of audit's role, stating that people want to know whether a company is being honestly run and is likely to have a future. Now, between them, these three reviews put forward more than 150 recommendations, albeit with some overlap which the UK government has now considered in detail and combined into one overarching public consultation document. Although this was only published last month, some 15 months after the finalization of the last three underlying reviews that I referred to. You may have noticed that I referred to audit reform at the outset, but the reality is that the regulatory reviews and now the government consultation goes well beyond audit covering corporate reporting, corporate governance and stewardship. Indeed, some of the most far reaching proposals related to matters other than audit. For example, the potential introduction of a Sarbanes-Oxley style reporting on controls and financial information and greater accountability for directors and corporate officers. But for the purpose of today, I will deal solely with audit matters where the consultation looks at areas such as strengthening the supervision of audit through a new, more powerful regulator with enhanced investigation and enforcement powers, including greater oversight of audit committees and audit quality more widely. It also looks at introducing new duties and obligations on auditors and directors, including taking a wider range of information into account in reaching judgments and in detecting and preventing fraud. It also recommends introducing a managed shared audit regime 
requiring individual audits to be shared between a large firm and a smaller firm. There is also a requirement for operational separation between the non-audit and non-audit arms of certain firms, principally the largest uh, audit networks. And it also includes a new corporate auditing profession to operate independently of the existing accountancy bodies. Now, clearly these areas of reform would have fundamental implications for the audit profession in the UK. And we at the ICAW are currently very carefully considering our response to all of the questions and proposals. And we'll be making our submission ahead of the deadline in July. Whilst these are UK proposals, I think it's fair to say that uh, many countries around the world are also looking at what's happening in the UK. And we might expect other uh, national regulators to uh, look at the outcome of these proposals and initiatives that are introduced once that takes place. So if I can have the next slide, please. I just want to say a bit about progress to date. The profession has already realised the need for change some time ago. And indeed, even before this final consultation was issued, some proposals from those earlier reviews have already been taken forward. In particular, the largest audit firms are making very significant improve investments to improve audit quality, and in particular to improve the ratings achieved from various regulatory reviews, whether they're undertaken internally within the firms or externally by regulators, including the ICAW's Quality Assurance Department or indeed the FRC. And there are signs that these investments are having the desired effect with progress being acknowledged by the chief executive of the UK's FRC. I say that these investments are being made in the UK. The reality is uh, that effectively they're part of bigger global investments uh, by the global networks, uh, recognising, as I said earlier, that the issues that are the focus in the UK are not confined to the UK alone. The second area of importance, I think, is that the FRC has itself moved ahead on a voluntary basis with the large firms publishing a framework for the operational separation of their audit and non-audit businesses. This framework includes 22 principles together with underlying objectives, outcomes and associated regulation. And whilst it's fair to say that there are some territories around the world where audit and non-audit businesses can't coexist together, I think this is the first occasion in one of the major capital markets uh, where such proposals are being taken forward. And I do see this as a really key initiative. I'd be happy to say a bit more about that in Q&A later. The FRC has also made progress on its own transformation, including streamlining its own governance, enhancing its complaints handling processes, and generally improving its enforcement activities. To help inform the process and illustrate our desire to improve integrity and audit, the ICAW has been active throughout, engaging with government and regulators, but also putting forward our own insight. Of course, through COVID-19, there's also been the opportunity to lead in helping to ensure that audit adequately addresses issues raised by the pandemic. Next slide, please. At the end of last year, uh, we published our audit manifesto and this is a document based around a set of principles which demonstrates positive thinking about what lies ahead for audit and its wider role as a force for good in the economy and society this follows our audit futures program a cross-professional action research initiative which we have hosted for the past few years and which has involved over a thousand audit and accounting professionals students and academics we distilled all of the insights we've gained from this programme into five principles in our audit manifesto, which we believe can help to advance the policy debate and support the development of a modern, improved audit profession. These principles are firstly that auditors should be able to articulate, uphold and communicate the profession's societal and economic purpose. Secondly, a focus on developing and promoting the distinctive identity of the audit professional. Thirdly, to foster a collaborative learning community for the professional practice of audit. Fourthly, 
is a commitment to support holistic professional formation and education. And finally, the fifth principle is to adopt a design mindset to think and work differently. Taken together, these principles call for serious attention to purpose, identity, communication, education, and mindset, and frame our contribution to reshaping and rebuilding our profession in the UK. Next slide, please. As part of this reform of audit, it's also important to note that the desire for assurance over non-financial information has been growing over the years, and many companies now obtain assurance on ESG information. This is likely to increase for three reasons. Firstly, as governments introduce more requirements to meet their own goals to honour commitments related to, for example, climate change, this will increase the need for information to be reported. Secondly, investors are likely to want greater assurance as one of the inputs in assessing the extent to which companies meet their own responsible investment criteria. And thirdly, because societal concerns over these matters are increasing, along with calls for a rebalancing of the purpose and profit motives for companies. So a huge part of securing the future integrity of audit is ensuring that it successfully responds to these stakeholder needs. I believe that the effect of all of the above, combined with the significant investment in audit quality initiatives by audit firms, which I mentioned earlier, will lead to improved audit quality. And once the results of these improvements flow through to audits reviewed by the regulator, improved audit quality ratings. In turn, this should increase stakeholder confidence, but it is unrealistic to expect that these regulatory initiatives and reforms will mean the end of corporate failures in the free market economy. Next slide, please. Increased stakeholder confidence in audit is one, albeit a very important one, ingredient of the wider challenge to maintain reputation and trust in our profession. And I'll turn to this subject more broadly now. Strengthening trust in chartered accountants features as one of the major themes of ICAW's new strategy for the decade ahead. So we're clear that this will run through the heart of our operations for some time to come. There are two general points on this, which have always been the heart of our profession which are increasingly important given the level of scrutiny. The first and arguably most important point is that as chartered accountants, each of us must demonstrate to those that we work with or for that we undertake our work ethically. At the ICAW, that means adhering to the fundamental behaviours set out in our own code of ethics, integrity, objectivity, confidentiality, professional competence and due care, and professional behaviour. The second is that we need to ensure that there is confidence in our own regulatory activities through the effective and independent oversight of our regulatory activities. In the UK, there are other bodies being established which over time have taken over aspects of regulation that would have been previously undertaken by the professional bodies, including the ICAW. The FRC as the ultimate competent authority for audit is a key, but not the only example of this. But we should not see this as a case for reducing our own activities. I believe that self-regulation is one of the hallmarks of a profession which differentiates us from a trade body, which is a term that some have used to describe the ICAW. I believe that the professional bodies have a valuable role to play in this area and our own initiatives to increase the independence of our regulatory activities, primarily with the creation of an independent ICAW regulatory board and increased lay membership throughout the entirety of our regulatory committee structures are key elements of ensuring this. But whilst we need to ensure that our narrative is strong in terms of defending our profession against such criticism and articulating how we contribute to society, we also must ensure that this narrative is matched by actions which demonstrate that the public interest aspect of our responsibilities and under the ethical code for accountants, and in the case of the ICAWR Royal Charter, distinguishes our profession from others in businesses. Next slide, please. 
Auditors need to be responsive to stakeholder and societal needs. We need to be relevant. I've talked about audit responding to changing needs in terms of both the expectation gap and more useful auditor reporting on a wider range of matters if trust in audits is to be maintained. But a similar challenge is, exists for the wider accountancy profession. Our vision of the ICAW is of chartered accountants enabling a world of sustainable economies. As I mentioned earlier, if we look ahead to the end of the current decade, we will have to deal with some huge challenges. The most obvious is, of course, COVID-19. Whilst initially a health crisis, the economic legacy of this will exist for many, many years as economies seek to rebuild, restore public finances and strengthen balance sheets. But even before the pandemic, the global challenges were significant. For example, sustainability is and will remain at the forefront of the agendas of business, governments and society. And we are also in the midst of a technological transformation with the implication on trade and business, as well as our own work. To these two challenges, you could add others, increasing nationalism in economic policy impacting on trading relationships, the changing social contract which underpins the free market economy and so on. Chartered accountants will have a role to play in addressing all of these challenges, and our success and visibility will be essential in ensuring our reputation and building trust. Let me take a small example in the form of the ICAW's response at the outset of the pandemic. Whilst our initial focus was on the safety and well-being of our staff and the ability of ICAW to operate in support of our 184,000 members and students around the world, this quickly evolved into three areas. Firstly, using the coverage of our members in the UK and their knowledge of the three million businesses that they advise to harvest real-time information on the issues that businesses were facing in accessing the various government support schemes and using this input to feed into government. Secondly, working with government and regulators to refine those support schemes and also to identify what forbearance might be needed in reporting of regulatory requirements, whilst at the same time providing updated and specific guidance to preparers and auditors of company information. And thirdly, establishing our coronavirus hub on the ICAW's website, which provided authoritative and timely information on the government support schemes and other COVID related information. At the height of the pandemic, the ICAW website was the most widely accessed source of online information on these matters in the UK. I believe that our response demonstrates not just our agility, but the fact that there is a deep underlying trust for the profession in times of difficulty. We must ensure that as the future challenges are addressed, we continue to be relevant. So let me say briefly what I think this means in the context of uh, one of the challenges ahead, sustainability. Next slide, please. I've already mentioned the importance of responding to a wider range of stakeholder needs as part of audit reform, but recent years have seen a dramatic increase in the attention paid to sustainability and specifically climate change, and displacing any notion that investors and companies may only pay lip service to it. For business, we had the milestone statement from the US Business Roundtable in 2019, and the major focus on sustainability on at Davos, the World Economic Forum, in early 2020. The British government is now looking forward to holding COP26 later this year and the opportunity for the UK to lead in this critical initiative. To digress just very briefly, it's interesting to note that there are three UK politicians with key roles in the organisation of COP26. Alok Sharma as president and Anne-Marie Trevelyan and Andrew Griffith in supporting roles. All three of these chartered politicians are also chartered accountants and members of ICAW. This may be a coincidence, but I prefer to believe that it's because the skills of chartered accountants are so relevant to this agenda. Despite the hardship it caused, the COVID-19 crisis has the real potential to be a catalyst for accelerated change. We know that the changes forced on institutions and ourselves as individuals have been dramatic in terms of working practices, lifestyles and economic circumstances. 
and cause us to contemplate things that would previously have been considered unrealistic. It's unlikely that we will have the opportunity to return completely to the old world, even if we wanted to. The future will undoubtedly be different to what we had expected a year ago. The Sustainable Development Goals can provide the framework we need to build around if we're to have strong and sustainable businesses and economies. They can be the framework for measuring the success of our recovery, whether in relation to climate and biodiversity issues, or in relation to the inequalities which are at the root of so many of the societal challenges that we see around the world. At the ICAW, we've made helping to achieve the UN Sustainable Development Goals another one of our key strategic themes and are embedding this throughout all our operations. Chartered accountants do have a key role to play in addressing the sustainability challenge. I recall in the early part of the last decade, at the start of my interest in this area, when I was working with the International Integrated Reporting Committee on the development of the Integrated Reporting Framework, Peter Backer, the Chief Executive of the World Business Council for Sustainable Development, was talking and made me sit up when he said that accountants would save the world. It's a memorable statement, but one which has uh, been echoed by others and certainly remained with me ever since. At the level of the profession, we can support the development of internationally recognised metrics and methodologies, which will enable government, societal and co corporate decision makers to address the economic and business challenges of the SDGs and the systemic transition and adaptation to sustainability and carbon neutral worlds. At an individual level, many of the core skills of accountants are relevant to those which will help businesses meet their own transitions in support of national goals. These include creating trusted information and insights that improve our understanding of the world, helping businesses to identify risks define goals, set the strategies to achieve those goals, and measure the success of those strategies. As a postscript on sustainability, I should add that the ICAW announced last year that it was becoming carbon neutral. We believe we're the first professional body in the world to do so. Importantly, we're assessing this after taking into account not just the direct impact of the ICAW itself, but also of our employees in their travel to and from work. This might represent only a small impact in the bigger picture, but it is a demonstration of our commitment and leading by example, and a key component of building trust. Next slide, please. I think that it's self apparent that notwithstanding the basic skills and training that chartered accountants have, if we're to make a difference in a meaningful way in addressing challenges that have not been addressed before, we will need new knowledge and new skills. For this reason, we need to ensure not only that our qualification adapts to reflect the knowledge and skills that accountants will need in their future careers, but also that existing members for whom these new challenges might have been absent in their careers to date have the necessary support to enable them to adapt. Whether new to the profession or long serving members, Professional bodies have an obligation to ensure that we are a leading provider of training, insight and guidance relating to technical policy, know-how and thought leadership on these new areas. Taking the example of sustainability, which I referenced, this will mean that auditors will, among other things, need to understand the new methodologies which may be needed to measure and report on non-financial information. Our flagship ACA qualification which Shinewing will be instrumental in implementing in Indonesia, is always evolving both in content to reflect the challenges of the future, but also in its form. And it's for that reason that we have moved fully, not only to computer-based exams, but also accelerated by the pandemic to remote invigilation, a tremendous achievement in the circumstances. It's also not just about our main chartered accountancy qualification, but increasingly in relation to other accreditations that we provide to a wider range of individuals to help enhance their business and financial knowledge, such as our certificate in finance, accounting and business and our business and finance professional designation. And more widely, the ICAW's audit and assurance faculty develops technical and practical advice to support all audit professionals, whether in business or practice. 
We publish thought leadership reports on a wide range of topics containing in-depth research and analysis. We also host webinars featuring experts from across the profession, as well as our own in-house specialists. And we post regular articles and updates on our Insights platform. The final aspect of ensuring that chartered accountants have the relevant skills is in recognising that as the required skills evolve, those that we accept into the profession may also need to change. So aside from looking in different places to identify the talent that will be needed, one route to achieve this will also be doing more to ensure that our profession and the profile of our members reflects the societies it serves, regardless of gender, ethnicity, sexual identity, or social background. Whilst there is much that the ICAW and the profession has achieved in this area, we're not perfect and there's much more that we can do. But this is just one more of the challenges that we face in the years ahead if we're to seize the opportunities that exist. So what thoughts would I leave you with? My overall message, notwithstanding the circumstances that we find ourselves in today, is one of optimism. There is no doubt that audit and the work role of auditors is under scrutiny at the moment, but that scrutiny has focused the minds to recognise just how important audit is and that those who practice it need to be expert. Significant investments by audit firms, regulatory reforms, and initiatives to make audit more relevant to the needs of users of corporate reports will drive improved audit quality and more relevant audits and audit reports. And there is, I believe, market recognition that this comes with a cost, but that it is a cost which is relatively small and worth bearing. At the same time, there are massive societal and economic challenges where chartered accountants are well placed to play a leading role. But to play our part, we must be at the forefront of cutting edge thinking and ensure that our members, through our qualification, post-qualification education and professional standards, have the requisite knowledge to make the contributions that the public and private sectors will need. If we grasp these opportunities, then the audit profession has a bright future. Thank you. Thank you, David, for that comprehensive keynote. Ladies and gentlemen, we have reached our panel discussion session. Before we get right to it, allow me to introduce our extraordinary panels to accompany David during the discussion session. Uh, they have quite a long list of achievements, so I'll try to uh, make it uh, a bit short. Uh, the first panel is Marco Carle, Management, the Managing Director of Shinewing International. Prior to becoming the Managing Director, Marco was the Managing Partner of Shinewing Australia, and he also had a fantastic career of over more than 34 years at Moore Stevens uh, in Australia, uh, and with the, the latest position as Managing Director. So his current role is focused on developing Shinewing International into a recognized global accounting network. And we also have with us uh, the chairman of Shinewing Indonesia and former IFAC board member, Bapak Ahmadi Hadi Broto, CACPA. I believe most of you from Indonesia and the region would agree that Pak Ahmadi is one of the most respected and influential figure in the accountancy profession and have been uh, the president of K president director of KPMG Hadi Broto and other key accountancy profession uh, such as of a key accountancy role such as the president of ASEAN Federation of Accountants, executive director of Indonesia Institute of Public Accountants, and president of Institute of Indonesia Chartered Accountants or EIE. Uh, the session will be led and moderated by a respected expert as well, Catherine Backshow, FCA, ICAW Manager for Auditing Standards. Catherine is an ICAW Chartered Accountant with 25 years of experience specializing in audit related technical issues. She wrote some of the first UK training materials on ISS in the mid-1990s. Uh, and she's also the author of numerous articles and publications on international standards on auditing. After getting her qualification with Ernst & Young, or EY, she worked in professional training for eight years before returning to practice in the Big Four in Warsaw. So ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, allow me to uh, introduce Catherine. Catherine, uh, please take it away. 
Well, thank you very much indeed, Andika. And good afternoon, good evening, and good morning to everyone. And thank you, David, for that overview of audit quality issues and some of the key features of the uh, proposed audit reform program in the UK. It's an ambitious project, and we know the world is watching. David referred to the significant investment audit firms are making to improve audit quality. And I'd like first to invite Marco to tell us something about recent initiatives that shine ring in this area and others you've maybe got in the pipeline and how you're thinking about measuring um, audit quality. Marco. Marco, you're on mute. Thank you very much, Catherine. And um, I'd like to extend um, a welcome to everyone joining us, but in particular, recognising our hosts, um, Shinewing Indonesia, in particular, Michael Sahari, um, who has made a significant contribution, not only to um, our international network, but also becoming an authorised trainer, uh, employer in Indonesia, or ICAEW. Um, Congratulations, uh, Michael. Um, I'd also couldn't help but notice that um, uh, I appear to be the, the only uh, presenter or contributor this evening that doesn't have an audit background. I, I can't help either commend uh, ICAW's uh, diversity uh, or alternatively question uh, the, uh, the decision whether in fact I should be presenting here this evening, no, no doubt. Um, I certainly do appreciate uh, this opportunity uh, and thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, David has rightly acknowledged the significant investment audit firms have, have made, particularly the large firms in improving audit quality. Before I provide an insight into the investment Shine Wing International has made, and in particular their member firms, I'd like to either remind or mention that Shine Wing International is a relatively young international network. And despite the IBR rankings placing us the 20th largest globally, we only comprise of 17 members, whereas our peers at that, at that particular level have many hundreds of members. This is both a challenge and an advantage from an investment perspective. Challenge in terms of resources, an advantage in respect to agility. We have also other unique challenges. The major transactional audit opportunities are sourced from China, and they are significant global organisations. And because we are relatively small in number, we do not have the global presence to service these clients. And we then rely on the larger firms, predominantly the big four firms, to support us. And we certainly appreciate the support that they have been giving us. Allow me to suggest at this point about evolutionary development, we are not only small by design, but by our stringent qualification requirements for admission. Audit quality, capability and scale are indispensable criteria for admission. So therefore we take a view at this stage in our evolution, the preventive medical approach is an important as investing in the development of our existing order practices. The investment of our order practice is also, ex is also extensive example. Uh, Shining China, for example, a national practice in excess of 8,000 people has a sophisticated IT platform and a big data resource hub in Xi'an dedicated to supporting the firm's order practice, as well as its member firm's order practice. Allow me to share with you some of the other challenges we have. Communication and relationships between member firms is of critical importance in maintaining the quality of our global audit assignments, particularly where there are significant language and cultural barriers. Xiaomi China has launched a commercial version of WeChat named WeCom which has allowed not only their staff, but also staff of other member firms to work remotely and permit thousands of web meetings and audit the quality focused training programs. Once again, this is just to provide you with an insight in terms of how we're approaching to deal with this particular issue. 
which is of critical importance, not only to the member firm, but clearly the board of Shine Wing International. Catherine, thank I'll hand Yeah, thank you, um, <coughs> Marco. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a good question uh, about IT and uh, the relationship between IT and quality, and we'll come back to that, to, to that later. Um, a question to Amadi. Amadi, as uh, chairman of Shine Wing, I know you're interested in the effects of remote auditing that's arisen from the pandemic or that's been accelerated by the pandemic, the effect of that on audit quality. Can you tell us something about that, not just for your firm, maybe, but for the profession more widely and for smaller firms in particular, maybe? Amadi. Amadi, you're on mute. Okay, thank you, Catherine. Let me first uh, quote what had been uh, <clears throat> issued by the American Institute of Certified Public Accountants in their webcast about uh, managing the challenge of remote auditing. <clears throat> they are giving the challenges and opportunities for this remote audit. On the, the challenges side, first of all, and I think this is really uh, <clears throat> true, is the challenge of internal control testing. Okay. We all, especially those who, who practice in, in public accountancy in audit, we understand that Understanding the internal control, assessment of the internal control of the clients, potential clients, is very, very uh, basic step in order to decide where to, to concentrate our uh, investigations, quote unquote, okay, to find which areas are having <clears throat> what you call a high risk of material misstatements and which one is not. And usually, but once we, we do that in our first audit, the next year, what we have to do is just to see, is there any changes? That's all. And usually not many changes. But now, especially uh, last starting last year and this year, okay, what we have to do in almost all the clients, the total environment of the internal control totally changed. Okay, that's a hard job. That's the challenge. But thanks God, fortunately, we pass it. Okay. Second, and this is a lot of talks about it, was the confusions about how to conduct inventory physical town observations. Okay. We cannot go physically to, to the client's factory. Okay. Everybody in the, the auditing profession talked about this. What should we do? Okay. So that's just the challenge. Again, luckily, with all the criteria, the, the creativity that we have, we pass that also. In certain situation, we just use alternative procedures if it's possible. If not, we use for the clients to do film the process while we're watching. Okay. So there's a lot of ways to do that. The third, and this is also true, probably not many people understand about this, is management inquiries face-to-face -face inquiries. What's the difference? Why not just having uh, online uh, discussions? No, face-to-face, -face, you can try to just the gesture of the management. Okay? Understanding the gesture, you know whether it's they are hiding something or they are trying to, to uh, whatever says that, 
to hide uh, probably for fraud that they are doing. Okay? Usually that is something that we can at least suspect something is not right by the question. Okay? Well, I have a very, very uh, <clears throat> unique experience. Well, very long time ago when I was uh, the first big five I was joining was uh, Deloitte at the time, where when I was meeting with the founder of one of the biggest uh, conglomerates in Indonesia, okay, the way he talked to us, myself and my managing partner that came there, the way he talked to us, okay, give us bad impressions. Coming back from that meeting, both of us decided that no, we are not going to audit this group of companies. And since that time until now, I never have any audit clients from that group. So, <clears throat> again, this is also a challenge, but by having a face-to-face uh, -face camera with cameras, at least we not 100% uh, can assess, but at least help us also. So that's little challenges. Okay? But uh, on the other side, there's some opportunities. Okay? One thing that I think is very, very important is that with working from home or from the office sometimes or so, okay, there are a lot of saving time on commuting. Okay, commuting from home to client's office. Okay, they actually give an opportunities. Okay, saving time. And that means if it's saving times, that means we can utilize the stuff twice. <laughs> okay, <clears throat> that's that's uh, one one. Uh, Secondly, and this is I think also uh, very important because of the saving time. Okay, what we can have is that avoiding our stuff of what we call a burnout situation. Okay, so there is no stress because of, okay, they can do it without heavy pressure okay, at home, okay, but under the uh, nice control from us, okay, they are doing the job okay, but because they are also doing it in a relaxed, relatively relaxed situation, we have uh, flexibilities to add more work to them and they are happy for it. Okay, so that's uh, probably at least the, the, the three things that uh, I think uh, is an opportunity. Not mentioning in the last one is that with the advanced uh, IT uh, development, okay, we are really thankful to God that we have these advanced technologies. It really helped solving this crisis. That's all. Thank you very much indeed, Amadi. You mentioned uh, a, a number of really interesting and important areas there. Uh, there's the issues of the, the change control environment, um, inventory counts and uh, reading body language in, in, in meetings. Uh, something that comes to mind in that context is ICAW's uh, audit COVID hub. And it was some of the first guidance that our audit and assurance faculty produced 
um, early last year was on the control environment, how to approach that, uh, and, it, and, and inventory counts. Uh, you make a very important point, an increasingly important point about professional um, integrity and a really interesting point as well about working from home and burnout. Um, it is going to be really interesting to see what the new world um, looks like. Um, as David says, it's not going to be like the old world um, or it's not going to be we're not going to completely go back to the old world, but it's getting the balance right going 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 forward so thank you very much indeed for that very interesting um so a question now for david and marco um it's clear from david's presentation that as a profession we need to think harder about expanding the scope of what we audit to cover a great deal more non-financial information than we've been used to so far um, David, you emphasised the importance of this as a real innovation on the part of the UK audit regulator. So my question to you both is, how does this translate into the qualities that we're looking for in the next generation of auditors and assurance professionals? How will they be different from our generation? David, would you like to go first? David, you're on mute. Uh, thank you, Catherine. There, there, there are a lot of different elements to this, I, th I think, and, and it's important to recognise uh, first off that um, there are going to be others that aren't accountants that will also be seeking to compete with us effectively in terms of providing assurance on some of these other areas. I, I think it varies to some extent in terms of what we're looking at. There will be uh, some information that effectively is derived from financial statements, if you like, uh, so KPIs, alternative performance measures, uh, other things that might be more obviously derived from financial systems that are very close to home for, 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 for auditors. But as you get into other areas, and let's take something again like um, uh, environmental measures uh, in terms of whether it's water consumption, whether it's energy consumption, whether it's emissions and so forth, where the underlying technical material uh, accountants might not be experts in. But uh, the way I look at it is this. Firstly, um, if I look back over my career, um, it, 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 in, at one stage, um, accounts were relatively simple. It was historic cost accounting. Uh, there wasn't much in terms of valuation. Uh, and uh, you could do pretty much everything yourself as a knowledgeable auditor. If I look today at, a, at a, what an audit involves, it involves uh, um, getting tax specialists involved. It involves getting valuation specialists involved. It involves getting actuaries involved, all of which help to contribute to the audit opinion. If you look at a wider assurance areas, again, you can just see that there are going to be others that we have to bring into the profession if we want to take responsibility for um, a pining in these new areas with uh, particular skills. But what I would also say is this, uh, auditors, financial statement auditors have an overarching skill, um, which is understanding the flows of information, controls over information and how it all gets brought together. Let, let me just give you an example of that. I remember one of the companies that I was auditing back at the in the first half of this decade was, um, oh, sorry, first half decade of this century, was one of the first companies to present um, uh, environmental information, uh, where a consultancy, not a audit professional service firm, uh, opined on the accuracy of that information. And they did it uh, for about 1% of the costs that we took to um, audit the financial statements. So they were taking immature systems um, in with qualitative information that was much less easy to get your arms around, no doubt from widely differing sources, whereas we were taking information from uh, consistent uh, financial systems that were applied around the world and somehow managing to give an opinion on that uh, for a fraction of the cost. And in my view, it demonstrates that actually, uh, whilst well-intentioned, uh, there's probably, a, uh, the reality is that there wasn't really proper process applied to how that information was aggregated, looking for consistency, looking for anomalies, uh, challenging and investigating. And it's all of those kind of skills that I think auditors, financial statement audits bring because of the rigor of the qualification that will be absent from uh, other specialists that might be knowledgeable in uh, how to measure an emission, 
but won't necessarily be experts in how that information is brought together and presented transparently and understandably uh, in order to avoid misleading. So, so you know, that the, the opportunities there for us as accountants to expand, um, uh, recognising that others will fill the void if we don't. Thank you, David. Now, that's an extremely important point about competition here. Um, uh, nobody's indispensable and um, we, we do need to adapt, but our fundamental skills of um, uh, analysis are as, as good as they've ever been. Um, Marco, you, I know, have an interest in soft skills in, uh, in, in how we go forward. Can you say a little bit about that? Yeah, no, thanks very much, Catherine. And once again, I, um, I feel that David's covered, you know, the, the information required um, so comprehensively, not only now, but also in his presentation. Um, it, it's, it's interesting. I, I, I do have a view, particularly one that has evolved through my career in the profession, that to a certain extent, what we expect of our professionals today is technical competence, ethical, ethical professionals with strong values. Um, more often than not, we do take that for granted. But there is an expectation that we should have those key, call it, ingredients in all our professional uh, members, um, whether they're auditors or any other professionals offering service offerings within our profession. Um, so the interesting issue is what do we have today? Uh, and what are we expecting of the next generation of our assurance professionals? So we could argue that, you know, they would need to develop a proficient understanding of the industry and sector that they're currently working on, or a strong appreciation of the risk areas and a thorough knowledge of both historical failures and successes within the industry and sector. Um, and at the same time, maintaining a strong sense of skepticism, particularly in our existing environment, as David clearly identified in his presentation. And at the same time, have an ability uh, to secure a professional working relationship uh, in respect of all our stakeholders, particularly clients. I mean, that might sound like an oxymoron, that we're sceptical, and at the same time, we have to maintain a relationship of trust with our particular clients. Um, how do we deal with that issue? That, to me, at face value, is a real challenge. And... Yet, at the same time, it is of critical importance. We spoke about trust, and I'll speak a little bit later, how our values are the cornerstone of a successful organisation, whether it be in a government, private, public organisation. And where those values are, are breached, then that is essentially the recipe for, for failure going forward. And it's an understanding of the importance of what we often describe as soft skills. Um, where we're able to balance that, uh, call it equilibrium, where we're able to discharge our responsibilities and at the same time maintain relationships, uh, particularly of trust. Um, I question whether, in fact, our education system uh, today addresses those particular issues, um, both at the tertiary level and even at the graduate level and postgraduate level. Um, and these are attributes that more often than not, we, we, do, we do learn on the job. And at times it comes at a cost because they're not addressed the way that they should be. Um, one would argue that we would have to maintain the same capabilities of an international diplomat um, in discharging our roles and responsibilities, knowing very well as a diplomat their, their responsibility is to protect uh, their organisation uh, or region. So um, it is both a challenge, but nonetheless, something that we do need to turn our minds to as educators, because we have an education role uh, in our profession, in our firms, in our international organisations. Thank you, Marco. Um, we uh, have uh, a few questions coming in and we have a few more panel questions to get through, um, uh, which is 
which, which is good. So um, I, if we can keep the next uh, two or three questions, if the responses to those reasonably brief, that will help us get to the questions from the floor. Um, picking up on something uh, uh, that uh, David said a moment ago about the fact that you, you, you can't do it all yourself anymore. I'd like to ask a question about um, regulation. Um, um, Amadi, um, the impact of regulation on audit and how audit regulators can contribute to audit quality. I think some audit regulators think it's got nothing to do with them. It's everything to do with the firms. But ICAW believes that everyone, the wider stakeholder group, um, has a role to play in, in audit quality. Mitchell mentioned this in his opening remarks as well. We can't do this alone. Shine Ring operates in 15 countries and you're expanding. Um, it all involves compliance with lots of different audit inspection regimes. Can you give us your take on what you think a good and forward-looking audit regulator in this region should be doing right now to help firms, particularly smaller practices, to raise the audit quality bar and embed a real culture of audit quality? Amadi. Amadi. Amadi, you're on mute. Okay. There we go. Well, okay. Based on my uh, observations, uh, when I was uh, acting as half a president and I thought what member, uh, it is, I think it is not possible to, to generalize what all Audi regulators should uh, be doing. Okay. Each country has their own unique cultures and, and uh, economic status, okay. and also the, the, the nature of the governments itself. Okay. So let, let's meet, uh, look into Indonesia. So far, the government, I can say, almost silent. Okay. Well, because it is enough for the profession to do something about it. Okay. But as uh, <clears throat> David uh, presented in UK, okay, yes, there should be a lot of changes being needed. Okay. Yes, we have certain uh, audit failure in the past, even in last year, uh, last two years ago, probably okay, we have, but not so serious like what was happening in, in uh, Europe and, and in US, probably. Okay, so uh, therefore, <clears throat> to me, okay, the most important thing is for the government and the professional bodies at least for Indonesia, okay? For them both to sit down together and decide what has to be done and who should do it, either the government or the professional bodies. Okay, let's do it. Thank you. Oh, that's a good point. The cultural differences make a massive difference to the way these things work. But you emphasise, nevertheless, the importance of, of, of working together. So, uh, so that's good. Right. Um, briefly, David, you referred in your presentation to the profession being subject to intense media, political and regulatory scrutiny. That isn't confined to the UK, of course. But you talked about the need to ensure that our, narr that our narrative, the story we're telling is strong in defending our profession against unfair criticism. Can you say a bit, little bit more about that and about the messages the profession needs to get across globally about the good work it's doing in the audit space? David. I, I, I think there are lots of themes, Catherine. I mean, the first fundamentally is I don't think people do necessarily understand uh, that around the world, under various codes of ethics, accountants will operate under a public interest responsibility, which by and large won't be there for other people in business. 
that's the first thing. The second thing is clearly the high quality of the training and what the rigor that it takes to get a qualification like the uh, ACA in the UK. But more fundamentally, I think you then look at, and again, let me come here to the work of the large professional service firms rather than accountants in business, although I can make the case of the link very clearly. But the reality is that a lot of what we do is about helping organisations to get things right. Um, in audit, it's uh, helping to ensure that financial information or increasingly other information is presented properly so that investors can trust it. In work that we do around uh, tax, it's supporting taxpayers to get their tax returns right in accordance with tax law. Uh, in uh, helping them to look into control deficiencies or systems, it's helping them to improve their process and efficiency and therefore better returns for employees and shareholders and other stakeholders. Um, you could, the list goes on, if you like, in terms of uh, uh, what our ultimate purpose is. And too often, it, in my view, is reduced to um, a, a question of focusing solely on when things have gone wrong rather than the myriad of times when uh, they've gone right. The final point I'd say is there's a piece of being responsive as well. And this, I think, comes back to one of the questions that we've got about a design mindset. And, uh, you, you know, there is the point that um, quite often in the past, I think the response of the profession when we people have asked, um, you know, we want audit to do more in relation to fraud. We want audit to do more in relation to going concern. Uh, we'd love the auditors to tell us uh, more about what they've found. You know, our response has often been, you don't understand. An audit only means this in relation to fraud. An audit only means this in relation to going concern. Our opinion only tells you whether the financial statements as a whole present fairly the information or, or give a true and fair view. But in, so we've got to be um, more adaptive and responsive to societal needs, which is why, again, is the UK was probably one of the first places, um, a, a forerunner of some of the international initiatives by um, uh, the IASB, if you like, in relation to long form audit reports, uh, where we had uh, graduated audit findings in relation to key audit areas where the audit was actually giving a, a, a view on uh, where on the scale of judgment a particular uh, assessment had been made by management. And it's things like that that are more responsive. And the final area, I think, is as well just recognising that actually when you look at what the profession has done in terms of, I think, and again, maybe this is just the UK, I suspect it's, it's not, but on the whole question of diversity and inclusiveness, I think when you compare it to uh, many businesses or other professions, uh, the chartered accountancy profession will be seen as a, a leader rather than a follower in that area. So these are all things that are important to society, I think. Thank you, David. Yes, and the, getting, getting the messaging right about the public interest in the training, helping organisations getting things right, being adaptive, having the level of, of diversity, all key messages, and, and, and are not as widely appreciated as they, uh, as, as they could be. Thank you for that. Okay, um, I would like now to turn to the uh, questions from the um, floor. I'd like to take the three that we've got. Um, I'll, I'll take the first question from Stephanus, perhaps second, but I'd like to take the, the, the second two questions from Frankie um, and Cecilia um, together. So Frankie is asking, um, the cause of the pandemic, uh, you, as a result of the pandemic, usually audit risk is higher than normal. Um, um, and there are restrictions on, on, on doing the audit. Does it make sense to accept or lower audit quality be no, below the normal standards um, because of the pandemic. And it's sort of related, I think, to the following question from uh, Cecilia, um, is, is there any alternative for auditors to know more about the internal controls, um, uh, about the company, the clients, when you're working from home? And I wondered, um, if I might put a Mardi on the spot on, 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 on those two subjects, because you've, you've alluded to, 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 to both of them earlier. Amadi, can you say something about those two second questions? Okay, uh, for the questions from uh, Frankie. Hi, Frankie. Uh, let me say that, uh, no, it's, it's no, nothing that we can compromise. 
we should not compromise on our equality. Okay. Actually, what we need to do is actually to, to, to add more probably sampling. Okay. Because of this uh, situation where we, we are not physically attending the uh, location of the client, probably we have to expand the sampling. So not reducing or, or cutting the, the, the work, no. The risk of we are not finding the material misstatement is high. And therefore, under theory of audit, the higher the risk, the higher the sample that you should take. More work for you. That's just uh, uh, my answer to do, uh, Frankie. Okay, for Cecilia. Okay. For Cecilia, uh, what I can say, well, it is still we, we have to, to review as, as again, it is very important to understand internal control, to decide the areas that we really need to look on. Okay. Uh, it still has to be conducted. It is just what we are doing is remotely, but we cannot avoid it. Definitely we cannot skip it. Thank you. Thank you, Amadi. Right. Um, uh, question from uh, Stephanus. I think maybe for David. I think it was David. You referred to uh, the, the the designed uh, mindset. David, can you elaborate on that a, a little for us? Yeah, I, I think I touched it in, in my response to a, a question just recently. Actually, I mean. For, for, for me, this is about thinking more broad mindedly about how we meet uh, expectations and respond to what needs are rather than just sticking to a historical or traditional view of what an audit is. Um, because, you know, the world is changing. It's interesting that when you look at um, the much greater focus that investors, for example, have on non-financial information today, I think there's a growing realisation that there's a strong correlation, for example, between... Um, uh, a good ESG performance and ESG governance and uh, shareholder value and return that actually is promoting, if you like, ethical investment in a way that we might not have envisaged, uh, even if you'd like, just for the sake of doing good, if I may put it that way. Uh, so that's going to mean that investors are going to need uh, much more uh, assurance, I think, that actually if they're uh, uh, placing a lot of emphasis on this new kind of information that they're happy that it's right. So we've got to be more responsive to that and think about how we overcome some of the challenges that are in, inevitable in terms of moving into new areas. And that's whether it's the work that we're doing, uh, whether it's um, uh, how we report or what we report, whether it's how we manage the risk of, of doing all of that and so forth. So I think it is a broad minded and open minded thinking about how we do things differently. The, the, the final point I'd make is that as business gets more complicated, the world gets more complicated, organizations get larger, um, requirements get um, uh, uh, more expansive, uh, expectations get higher. That all leads to complexity and um, uh, potentially an exponential increase in the volume and amount of work that one needs to do in, in relation to the totality. And I think we've also got to look at how we can uh, simplify things to get to the same conclusions with the um, same degree of confidence, uh, rather than just relying that every new initiative, whether it's reporting, whether it's area of work or whatever it is, uh, carries with it its own discrete area of work. So how can we find synergies between different information streams? Uh, how can we get to conclusions quicker? Uh, how can we make sure that our, um, the volume of work is not necessarily related to um, the volume of reporting requirements, all things like that. I think there are things that we can do to be innovative if we have the right design mindset. Thank you very much indeed, David. Yeah, being, being forward looking um, uh, rather than backward looking, absolutely critical. Uh, to all of this. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we've got two minutes left. I'm going to um, wrap up here. I was struck by the, um, the degree of congruence between the theme of David's presentation, which was on trust 
and the um, Shine Wings corporate values, which uh, I looked upon the website, which are trust, truth, fairness, and, 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 and harmony. And I think we've talked directly or indirectly about trust, the importance of it, the fact that we do have a huge amount of it, but the fact that we need to maintain it uh, going forward and that being central to what we do as uh, professional accountants. Um, thank you very much indeed to all of the uh, panellists, to Marco, to David, uh, and to Amadi, uh, to, uh, to our new partners, uh, Shine Wing, um, uh, to Mitchell, uh, to Andika for, uh, uh, for emceeing this event and for everyone who's provided the backup and indeed to all of our attendees. Uh, and thank you for your, for your excellent questions as well. 10.29, I'm going to give you a minute of your life back. Thank you very much indeed. Good evening and good morning. Thanks very much, Catherine. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you very much, Michael, Amadi, David, Catherine, Nika.